yeah yeah okay I'll come we're just going to wait a few minutes to uh work till the people coming in settles and then we'll get started so welcome So we have, uh, welcome everybody, um, in the chat we are going to um, be putting our shared document, so please do click on that shared document, um, I'm going to say if you can, because I know we've got quite a few people who've come in all the way, or zooming in all the way from China, and I know you can't access that, but name in, in, the, um, in the chat for us, and then we can add it for you. Um, but please do go onto the shared document if you can and add your name on the third page, I think it is. I can see people doing that already, so that's great. You're all very well trained in Zoom. So we'll just give people a few more minutes to come in and then we will get started. But very welcome to you on a Friday afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are in the world. And get started yeah <laughs> why not why don't we, we should, do the introductions yeah exactly i think we should start so that uh, yeah, we have enough time for everything great <laughs> uh, yeah you want me to share the presentation right <laughs> <laughs> i do i'm waiting Sorry. i'm waiting patiently <laughs> it's okay <laughs> Uh, okay. There you are. So much. Um, and I can see Zach has um, pressed the record recording button. So thank you very much. Um, so welcome everybody who's here for our workshop on using repositories um, as part of our sort of series of open research um, skills workshops through. Um, this EOSC Life funded project of the um, International Committee on Open Vitalist Science. So very much welcome. Um, we are um, going to dash through today. Uh, so yes, thank you, Carla. Um, you do have access to our um, this this uh, these slides. So please do um, access those. It's in the link is in the shared document. And please, if Zach could put that into the chat as well, that would be wonderful. Um, so you can join any of our um, uh, different links here. We have a Slack group for the Open Vitalist community. We have a mailing list. Uh, we have a multilingual website. And we also have Twitter and Facebook and other social media accounts. Um, next one, please. So um, we are having um, Spanish translation, live translation, and also Chinese um, live translation today, which is very exciting. And the instructions are here in these different languages. And so to actually hear them, what you need to do on your Zoom um, browser that you're in now, you need to go down to the bottom um, where it says uh, it has a um, uh, image um, and you press that interpretation button and it takes you to um, a little pop up which shows you the different languages. So then you have to select the language you want, Spanish, English, or Chinese, and then you will start hearing it in that language. Thank you, Carla. Next one. Oh, Carla, you. Oh, yeah, uh, that, that's me. Hi. Um, probably many of you knows me already, and for those who don't know me, I'm Carla Lancelotti. I'm a professor, a research professor at Universitat Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. Uh, I've been working with PyTolitz uh, uh, since my PhD, so for a long time now, and uh, 
uh, I'm also part of the uh, International Committee for Cyclic Open Research with Emma. I'm not going to say anything else because it's all here on the slide, including the links uh, if you want to see what I'm doing at the moment. And I'm Emma uh, Karoon. Um, I work at Historic England and also the Alan Turing Institute as a researcher. Um, and I'm particularly focused on vitalists, but also open research. So there's lots of details about me here. Um, and um, yeah, let's carry on, Carla. Let's keep going. Um, and just a quick introduction to our um, International Committee on Open Vitalist Science. So we are very international. We have people from all over the world, as you can see, all these lovely people on the screen are helping us in this committee. Um, and we are really focused on training at the moment, which is why we are uh, running these training workshops. Um, next one, Carl. Um, we just want to um, highlight our code of conduct before we start, um, because it's important to us that everybody is treated well um, within these meetings and these workshops. So um, we really just want to encourage everyone to have a very positive attitude to their learning and to respect other people. Um, if we um, think anything inappropriate is happening, then we'll just remove you from this um, Zoom space. Um, if you think that um, something inappropriate has happened, then please do contact me. Um, I'm on there or my colleague, Celine. Um, our emails are also in the shared document. Thank you very much. Next one, please. So yeah, so um, what we're going to do today is we're going to have some introductions, which we'll, Carla will start in a minute. Then we're going to be um, having a bit of a break for some questions. Um, and then we will go on to doing a bit of a demonstration of different repositories. And hopefully at the end, we will have some time to um, let you work through using some of the repositories as well. So I'm going to hand over to Carla. Okay, before we start, I remind all of you, uh, especially the people who have uh, only joined us uh, uh, now, that you have uh, uh, at your disposition three different uh, languages for this talk. So uh, we have Spanish and Chinese interpretation. You can access these by clicking on like the live translation button at the bottom of your uh, Zoom window, and you can just pick uh, the language you want to listen the, this talk uh, into. So, uh, okay, let's start by looking at the uh, topics we are going to cover today, and also what are the learning objectives and outcomes of this talk. Uh, we are going to show you. Um, how to use a repository, as Emma was saying, for archiving your research output. Uh, and before this, we're going to uh, give you a few tips on how to choose a repository and what can be archived and how. And uh, uh, we're going to explain uh, how the licenses work and how to choose them again. So as an outcome, learning outcome, you should be able, at the end of this talk, to use a data repository for archiving uh, your research output. So again, uh, as an introduction uh, to a repository, um, we're going to see uh, what type of repositories are available, uh, how to choose the right repository, what are licenses, the types of outputs that can be put in a, repo in a repository, and then we are going to show you how to use one specific, specific one uh, and you know how to create an account and reserve a digital uh, identifying object, how to archive files and what kind of data and metadata you need to, um, to put into the repository. And then, you know, hopefully we will have enough time to um, do a bit, you know, to, to ha you have a go at uploading files in a repository. For those of you who were here at the last, uh, uh, at the first session, uh, as we discussed then, there are many ways to make your research articles and all your research output open access that do not require paid services from journals. 
Today, we are looking specifically at the repository for research output. So we're going to look at uh, the open repositories that are at the uh, top uh, right corner of these slides. Um, these are only some examples of the different repositories that are available. They are probably the most commonly used, but as you will see in this talk, there are many others. You may also have a, your university or your research institute, wherever your base, may also have their own uh, repository. So again, we will look at that. Uh, we'll look at, at all that in this presentation. So if we look at this uh, uh, image, right? Uh, this image represents more or less the whole universe of open access venues that you have available, available. So on the one side, there are preprint servers that we touched upon uh, in uh, our last session, where you can deposit uh, your uh, papers, for example. Uh, and then on the other side, so to the right of this, uh, of this uh, slide, you have um, open access repositories where you uh, can deposit what we are used to think as the supplementary information that are related to your publication, from raw data to additional figures to the code you use for statistical analysis, if you did that, et cetera, et cetera, right? In between these two big categories and a good place to understand what are the available options sits the uh, open access repository registries or directories. And we will have a look at that uh, in a little while. So what are the main characteristics of an open access repository or a good open access repository? Uh, they should all abide by the trust rules that you see on these slides. So these repositories should be transparent, meaning that you should be able to easily find and access information on the scope of the repository the target user community, the repository policies, and their capabilities for data storing. They also should uphold good standards of data and metadata description so that the user know uh, that they can rely on what is deposited in this repository. So they should be responsible somehow for what is deposited in, in, um, in it. The repository should be focused on the users, for example, by creating communities in case of a generalist repository, or for example, by enforcing the use of specific data formats that are understandable and comparable within one specific community, if we are talking about a, a, a subject-based repository. They have to be sustainable, and this basically means that they should ensure uninterrupted access to their uh, data, their data holding for current and future user users. And finally, they should count on the appropriate technological means to ensure all, all of the above. Generally speaking, there are uh, three main categories of open access repositories. Uh, as I was saying before, there are institutional repositories, like you see here on the left side. And I've just put some examples of which uh, um, I'm more familiar in case of you know, like the e-repository of my university, UPF, uh, or uh, repositories that I know um, of institution of people from our committee, for example, CSIC in Spain or the Texas A&M A University um, in the United States. Then there are domain specific repositories, the column like in the center, let's say, uh, which are, you know, as the name says, they are specific to a certain domain. For example, for archaeology, we have 
the archaeological data service or open context or the digital archaeological record. So these are all repositories that um, host only data or outputs related to archaeology, for example. And you can have these of many other subjects. Uh, and then we have uh, generalized repositories on the right uh, on the right hand of these slides, which means repository that are not specifically linked to a subject, but accept materials from any disciplines um, that you can think of, right? Uh, one thing that I would like to uh, underline right now is that uh, um, especially for the domain specific repositories, be aware of the existence of some repositories that are free for data consultation. So anyone can go and have a look at the material that's there and even download it, but they require payment to deposit the data. And this normally happens when the uh, repository mm, apply charges as they provide uh, some sort of data curation service. So it's not only you who upload your material, it's that they check the data and they format it and you know they make sure that it adheres to the uh, standards of the repository. Um, so let's see if it works. I just wanted to show you uh, our repository here at UPF. Uh, how it works and how it's organized. Um, when you enter the repository, you have different categories, these different uh, uh, squares. In this case, we're going to look at the primary research data, right, which is the one in the uh, yellow. Uh, if this works. Okay. You should be able to see that my web page. Okay. So, Primary research data, you click into it and you have a list of communities within the university of you know, people or department or uh, research project. And lucky for us, the first one is actually uh, our group's data. So you can click on it and see uh, what we have deposited in this repository. And these can be organized depending on the repository, obviously, in several different uh, subcategories. In this case, we have general research group data and uh, the one pertaining to one specific project. Um, and then we have here the most recent depo the deposits. For example, let's look at this one, which is. Um, which is relevant for our community today. Uh, 400 and 429 phytolip images of eight different morphotypes. Okay. And this is so you click on it and you can see the record, right? Normally, you have all the information about what kind of record this is. So you have a description of what you are finding it. You have uh, the indication that this is actually linked to a paper uh, here at the end of the description. You have on the left hand side uh, a few information like what type of document it is, what type of file, in this case is a zip folder. Uh, you've got the license here that uh, gray um, CC image. Um, and you've got something that it's really interesting, which is the statistics for consultation of this uh, item. And if you click on it, you can see uh, how many people have, uh, have looked at, the, at this record and from where, which is normally really useful uh, when you want to, um, to use this as uh, indexes, you know, of, of how 
good your uh, record is or how mm, what kind of diffusion it had. So let's go back to the presentation. Uh, as I was saying, this is just an example. Uh, there are different, every institutional repository will be a little bit different, but more or less, they will all have the same information um, provided. So when you have to decide where to put your material, how do you choose the right repositories, considering that we've seen that there are so many options available. Well, first of all, there is no right or wrong repository, as long as it provides a DOI for your material, and as long as it follows the trust principle that we've seen earlier. So on this slide, there are some tips that you can use to make uh, a bit of an informed decision at the time of choosing a repository. So, you know, first of all, you check with your funder, the, the bodies that fund your research, because they might have uh, some sort of mandate of which repository you should um, deposit your materials in, or have other criteria that you should follow. Um, otherwise, check with the journal that you're uh, submitting with. If you are, if if you want to submit something that is related to a journal, check with the journal. Some of them maintain a list of the repositories that uh, uh, they approved and that they will accept uh, for you to deposit your material. Or in general, they might have specific policies uh, that you need to comply with. So if you are thinking of um, deposit material linked to a paper, it's always good to check with the journal. Um, the third step would be to check for some discipline specific repositories. Uh, because, you know, obviously, if you are an archaeologist, you would like your material to reach the highest number of archaeologists. So if you are, you know, a, a paleoenvironmental scientist, you would like your material to reach the uh, highest number of paleoenvironmental scientists. So uh, check if there is a specific repository for your material, uh, also because these uh, repositories have the best metadata schema for your data, right? So it should everything should be easier in general. Uh, if there's no specific uh, um, discipline specific repository, then use a generalistic one, right? These are all normally very versatile and they allow depositing several different types of output. They're very easy to use normally and they're also very well known, so um, many people know where to find uh, your material. And in the end, if none of this uh, uh, option is really good for you, then you can use your institution repository. As I said, there is no right or wrong. You choose what is best for you and for your data. Some other things that you might want to think about when you're choosing a, a repository would be, for example, what I was mentioning before, whether uh, it there is a cost for uh, depositing data. Obviously, you know, if, if you can't afford that, and uh, that's already a choice made for you in a certain sense. Uh, other things to be considered, for example, is how much storage, sp storage space a repository gives you. It's not the same whether you need to upload like some Excel files with numbers or hundreds of photographs. You know, obviously uh, they they have different uh, they have different needs in terms of storage space. Uh, you want to check, for example, whether the repository gives you a choice 
of licensing um, that you can apply to your data. If they have any embargo or restricted options for some reason, uh, you need to choose whether you want to put all your different outputs in one place or you know you want to use different repositories for different outputs um, you might want to uh, choose a repository depending on whether it gives you the possibility to link your um, your output with other tools or other apps like github which will uh, we'll have in the in the next uh, um, sessions, uh, or for example, whether it gives you the possibility to link directly with Google Drive for extra storage, or you know uh, anything that actually might help you in your research. Again, let me just um, remark again that if the repository is trustworthy if, if the repository follows the trust rules that I we were talking about at the beginning you should be able to easily find all this information in the description of the repository itself so if the repository that you are considering is not clear on these details then maybe you choose another one back to the whole world of uh, open access uh, uh, options. So at the, uh, well, slightly earlier, I mentioned uh, the existence of open access repository uh, directories. So let's see, for example, let's see how uh, this can help you in choosing a repository. And uh, we will use the example of open DOAR. So open DOAR is a, uh, as you can see from the description, is a global directory of open access repositories that you can search and browse and you can uh, have a look, you know, at what is available according to what your needs are. In the uh, description of what open DOAR is, it gives you the list of uh, the criteria uh, that a repository must have in order to be included in this directory. And I'm not going to go through all of them because you have the, the slides and you can always you know, look at them. But basically, uh, in order to be included in this directory, the repository has to be, has to be <laughs> trustworthy, right? So when you go on the uh, on the directory itself in open the OER, you can look for um, repositories by typing it a repository name, name or you know a subject or whatever. And then you can hit search or choose directly one of the repository that comes out while you're typing. So in this case, I just put, I wanted to search for a archeology span repository and just by typing archeo, I get this list, right? And um, I choose, sorry, let me go back. Uh, I choose archeology span data service. Right? I want to see what this repository is and you know what characteristic it has and how I can uh, access it. So once you, once you click on, on that repository, you get this list of you know the repository information, which is here, right? So it gives you, oh sorry, uh, it gives you the name of the repository, what type it is, whether it is disciplinary or generalist. In this case, obviously, it is disciplinary or discipline specific. Uh, it gives you uh, the permanent link to the repository, what type of content you can deposit or you can find in this repository. So in this case, journal article, thesis and dissertation, reports, working paper, data sets, or other special item types. It gives you what subject the repository covers, 
and any addition, additional information that might be of interest. Under the organiz organization tab, it gives you who's responsible for this um, repository, in this case, University of York in the UK. It gives you links to the policies, the open access policies that this repository follows. And a little bit of information about when it was created, when it was modified, etc. And if you see at the bottom, uh, it can also give you the possibility of suggesting updates for this record. So let's say that you know this is what I wanted. I I like this type of repository. I want to check it out. We go on um, we go on it, and we see that. Uh, um, in the search data, so you've, you've got different options. You can search data or you can deposit data, right? And they also have help and guidance, a blog with tips and everything. So let's think, let's say we want to search data. If you have three different types of search, you can search the database, you can search the archive, or you can search the library all of which are actually interconnected. So you might get to the same uh, results independently on uh, where you start. In this case, um, we are looking at the uh, archive. So you get a list of projects in reverse chronological order. Uh, you can filter this project. As you can see, it's like, 2,800 plus results. So they have a lot of material. So you can filter it uh, by subject or by chronological or by geographical scope, etc. if you're interested in looking for something very specific. And then if you click uh, in this case on the first, just randomly on the first one, um, you get again, the whole uh, record. And, and as you can see, many of the information that you see here are exactly the same as you had in the institutional repository. So you have the title of the material, you have a description, and then on the um, left-hand side, you have a link to download the material, to see the metadata, to see the usage, statistics, you've got your license, et cetera, et cetera, right? So basically exactly the same information, although they are organized a little bit different, but it's more or less uh, the same information for the institutional repository. Um, as we said, you know, all this material is covered by a license. Right? So I'll give over to Emma, who is going to give you an overview of the license, which is always something that, you know, creates a little bit of doubts when you're thinking of putting your material out in the open, you know, what if someone steals it, what am I going to do? So we've got licenses to protect us. So over to Emma. Thank you, Carla. Um, so Carla's uh, given you a really good introduction to different types of repositories. So I'm going on now to talk about different things you need to think about when you're going to put things into your, your research outputs into repositories. So the first of these is the license that you're going to use. So um, all repositories um, will require you to have a license on your research outputs. Um, so it's an important thing to think about. Um, what we want to do and the purpose of putting your work out. What we mean by this is open licenses have a set of conditions that are applied to this work, your original work. 
um, and the license gr grants permission for anyone to actually use this work as long as they follow the conditions that are set out in this license. Um, next slide, please. Um, so um, as Carla said, um, often researchers are not really sure about using licenses because we're not lawyers, basically. So that's something that lawyers usually deal with. But we do need to know a bit about them because we can use them ourselves on our own our, our, on our own outputs. Um, so um, some things uh, not to be concerned about are that um, uh, so sharing something online. Um, does not um, auto automatically make it reusable. And that means that actually we have to apply a license to all of our work. So if you just were to put your, put your work out there on a website, for example, nobody knows how they could use that data or that um, research output it is. So it must have a license on it. Um, the second point here, sharing with a license does not give away your rights to publish or sell the work. So um, putting a license on the work, you're actually retaining your own copyright. Um, I will say most of the time, and I'm going to explain that, but you you do retain yourself as the as really the author of that research output, whether it's data or anything else, you're not actually giving that away. Even in an open license, you're not giving away your own rights to, to own that work. You're just allowing other people to use it. Um, the third point, um, work shared with an open license um, is not to be used without attribution. So that's completely wrong because um, you have to, in most cases, and I'll caveat that again, because there is one case I'll talk about later, um, but um, on ma the majority of open licenses, it, people are required, uh, if they use your work, they are required to credit you for that work. So usually that's through uh, referencing in, in a paper or something like that. Um, and actually, it, actually, the, the last point is very important is really it's a real ethical um, issue, uh, Demia, because us as researchers, we should be giving credit to other um, authors of work. So it's more of an academic um, ethics that we should do it um, with any license that we see. So we should be referencing other people's data along with their other research outputs. Um, next slide, Peacock, please, Carla. So, um, so using open licenses, um, the real reason that we want to use open licenses is to allow other people to use our, our research outputs for them to remix them, which means that they can adapt them and change them. And actually other people can share your work as well in other forms. Um, and the way that we do this is uh, the way that we openly share our work is by adding these open licenses that tell people how they can actually reuse it, remix it and share this piece of work. Um, you can go to this reference, um, which is a chapter all about different types of licenses from the Turing Way uh, book. Um, it's also, I think, linked in the shared document. Um, and just my disclaimer here is that me and Carla, we are not lawyers. So um, if you are doing this, um, you can read more about it. Also at your institution, I know at my institutions, we have a legal department. So if I have certain contracts or something, I have to uh, I have to go and speak to them about it. But I'm but my institution has policies on open sharing of our research. So I know it says in that policy what license I should be using as a minimum on my work when I actually publish or deposit my work in repositories. So I can just go and consult those policies. So it's a good idea to go and look at your institution uh, as to what licenses you should be using on your work. Um, um, so, um, so as um, kind of, if we're thinking of ourselves as open researchers, the common elements of uh, of open licenses are that we want somebody else to use it. So anyone to take that work and start using it, like putting your data out there. There's many different ways that your data could be used, not just for the research questions that you have. So we want other people to be able to freely use our work um, to do other research. Um, we want them to also modify that work so they could add data to it 
data sets or they could use maybe your code in their project to analyze their uh, analyze their data something like that um, and we also want other people to be able to share and distribute our work so that means that um, they could actually um, use the data and then pass that on to some use with still using that same kind of license so those are the kind of three main elements to this um next one carla please so in terms of the actual licenses themselves um they actually um these licenses they do require you to be crediting authors of this work so i'm just going to go through different type general types of these licenses and then i'll show you a few different named ones, I suppose. So um, the one thing that people get a bit hung up on is the word copyright. So what that means is um, copyright is a type of intellectual property that we give, uh, that gives the owner um, the exclusive right to copy, distribute, adapt, display and perform um, if it was a creative work, so maybe us performing this presentation would count, um, uh, for a certain amount of time. So if that's your own work, then it would, you know, be for forever, really. But your the copyright is 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 your your right to be doing all these things for your work. And so licenses actually allow um, others to use your work by still giving you the credit for it. So you are retaining that copyright. But there are different types of licenses and um, um, so um, we have these um, what are called non copy left, which you would think would be called copyright, but they're not non copy left um, are very per permissive um, licenses. So very open ones. And they actually allow others to um, do all those things, use remix and share your work but they must give you the credit for it. And also any um, derivative works um, have to be shared or don't have to be shared with the same license. So these ones are the most sort of open ones and allow people to do pretty much what they want with your work as long as they give you credit. So I've put some examples there, which are CC stands for Creative Commons licenses. So CC by 4.0 is a common one. The MIT license and this BSD license are common, very open licenses. And then there are another category, which are the copyleft licenses. So these are sometimes called viral licenses or reciprocal licenses. And these um, do allow people to do pretty much the same thing as the open licenses, um, uh, the non-copyleft licenses, sorry. But um, when you actually, the derivative works from those, so for example, if you um, used somebody's data and merged it with other data sets, you would actually have to then license your work using that same copyleft license. Um, and so that's why it's called a viral license, because basically the license carries on with that piece of work if you're using it and to reuse and remix it and share it. So you've got to keep the same license of the original work. So that does cause some problems because it might actually not be how you want to license your work. You might want to be a bit more open with it. So it's a bit more, bit actually a bit more of a closed license in that way. Um, and there's some examples there. Um, the CC BY is a Creative Commons um, uh, SA license, which means share alike license. So as, as you can see, it's about sharing the same license. And then these other ones, GPL and G, uh, MPL license. Um, the other category is this um, real exception to, in terms of the copyright part, which I was saying about, um, is the CC0 license, so Creative Commons 0 license. And this is um, where you actually give away all of the rights to your work. And this is the most open license. So essentially, it means anybody can do anything with your work. They don't have to give you any credit at all. And actually, this is used quite a lot for data, actually. Um, and especially when people have finished their projects and they've done everything they want to do and they put their data for public use. So they're very happy to, for anyone to do anything for it and they don't want to get any credit for it. That's OK. But I think as researchers, we do want to get the credit for our work. So I, I would say a little caveat for me is that like to think in that case, if I put my work out like that, in terms of our academic ethics, people would still credit you because they still can credit you for that work. But um, if you do want to be credited, then 
you know, for sure, 100%, uh, don't use that CC0 license. Um, use their next more open one, which is the CC by 4.0 license. Right, next one, Carla. I'm speaking too much. So on the next few slides, and I'm not really going to speak much about these, it's just got some comparisons. So this one is about how much um, different, how permissive, so how open these different types of licenses are. So you can have a look at it in your time by looking at our slides. Um, next one, Carla. This one I think is a, um, a good one. It's from the Creative Commons um, website um, and it's just showing how open, so most free is the most open at the top, although they haven't actually included the CC0 license. Um, and then uh, the, all of these have you retain your copyright um, at the bottom is the least free, so the least open. So I think this is a good guide to kind of show you the types of licenses. On the Creative Commons website, you can actually see the full detail of all of the licenses. Um, so you can read in detail what all these different things mean. So to, you can see the share alike, there's no derivatives, you can have non-commercial licenses, and then you can do lots of combinations of those of non-commercial and share alike, or non-commercial and no derivatives. So there is different combinations of these different licenses that you can see. Um, next one, please. So um, there are more than just Creative Commons licenses. So here we've got different ones from the Open Data Commons, public domain licenses. Um, I think that's the only other one on there, but this is just showing you a comparison of these different licenses. Um, and next one, Carla. Um, so, um, so you're thinking, there's lots of different licenses. I don't know which one to use. Well, really, it depends what output you're putting out there. Um, as I've said, quite a lot of data is put out there with CC0 licenses, and you might want to choose that. That's the fully, fully open one. But really, um, we think about what type of license is appropriate for each output. So I've got a few examples here of um, if you were going to put out their um, publications like articles, uh, other documentation, images, and things like metadata files, you would probably use a Creative Commons license like the CC BY license because um, it's it's more specific to those types of documents. For things like analysis code, so software and analysis codes, the MIT license is usually used, although there are other ones. Uh, and also, um, what's it say, data will also have different license based on what you can and can't share. So uh, data sometimes has to be restricted in some way, so it might not be able to be used for commercial use, so you might want to put that onto the licence, but some institutions are really free uh, and happy to use the CC0 licence for all of their data. So again, having, having a look at your policies at your institution is quite important for, for these sorts of issues uh, with licences. Um, next one please, Carla. So how do you actually put a license on something? So with a repository, so the ones that Carla has been showing you, and she's going to go on to show you that these open um, and free repositories like Zenodo and Figshare, um, to select when you actually upload your data or your research um, output. So it, it's very easy. It's just a section on the metadata form that you have to fill in and you just have to uh, select the license from a click down list. So that's very easy. Um, you can also put licenses um, in other places. So I use GitHub a lot, and that's like a, a repository that's more of a working repository. And there you can actually put licenses on um, in terms of putting the whole file of the license into your repository. So you can actually, if I was going to use a Creative Commons license, I would go onto their website. They have the full draft of the, the actual license on there. I would just copy it, you know, like you do in, in Word or something. And then I would paste it into a new document and, and upload that into the repository. Um, and then you can actually, um, that would actually link it um, to to your um, main page of your repository on GitHub. Um, but I can, I'll, in the next session, we're going to do Git, learning how to use GitHub. So I will show you how to do that um, next time. Uh, next page, please. 
So, um, so I've covered a bit about licenses, some of the other things you need to think about when you're starting to use repositories are what should I put on there? So um, we've I've talked and Carla's talked a lot about putting data on there, which I think is very important for researchers. But actually, you can put all of your research outputs on there. So this re really is a list of everything you could put on there. There's probably more things. But um, if you want people to read your work, this is the way to get it out there. You know, it's not just about putting your publishing your papers and your data. It's actually about putting things out there. So all of our presentation slides from this training, we put on repositories. We um, we put teaching material on there. We put images on there. Carla showed you she had on her um, institutional repository. She had images, uh, sets of images on there from her work. So all of these things are really useful for other researchers to use. So I would really encourage you to put as much as you can um, onto open repositories because then other people can use them. Um, next slide, please. Um, so things to consider, um, and these sorts of things where Carla's going to talk a bit about when she goes through a demonstration, but we'll also talk about this in, in later workshops when we talk more about standardised vocabularies and when we talk about fair data as well. But um, it's important to think about um, what you're putting on there and how you're sort of the information that you're putting on with your research output. So this, this is really talking about data, but important for other other things as well so because you want people to understand what you're putting out there on a repository so it's important that people can also reuse them so you need to think about the file formats that you actually put on the repositories try and use open formats rather than ones that come from proprietary software so there are um uh, for data, it's things like um, CSV files instead of using an excess, uh, Excel file, because not everybody actually uses Excel, surprisingly, but that is the truth. <laughs> so um, a CSV file means that you can take it into any type of um, spreadsheet type software. And it's the same with images. It's the same with um, uh, documentation. There are more open forms, uh, formats for files. Um, you might also think about... Um, how the data itself has to be transformed and this could also go with documentation as well so um, do you need to digitize it in some way so make it accessible does it need to be an, uh, anonymized or pseudonymized the data because that is uh, relevant to quite a lot of different disciplines not so relevant to archaeology sometimes it is sometimes actually in terms of locations of archaeological sites that's that can be very sensitive but um, if you're working in something like the health field, a lot of the data that is openly, well, all of the data that is openly accessible has to be anonymized because you can't uh, have that tracking back to anyone's individual um, identity. Um, it's also important to think about the types of metadata. So metadata is the data about the data, so it explains the data. And actually, that's really important for understanding the data sets that you're putting out there. Um, and then lastly on here, you do need to think about the ethical and legal obligations of you uh, as a researcher, where your output has come from. Um, does it have this personal data in it? Um, that's very important to protect people's identity. They might not you know, get their permission or they, they might not want their data out there. So you need to remove it from the data set. Um, and in, in archaeology, we do need to think about who owns the data. You know, a lot of the time we go and we dig up archaeological sites. We don't own that. You know, it's someone else's heritage that we're digging up. So we need to be really, really careful with um, putting our, our uh, research outputs out there. Um, I would suggest that it's probably better to have them out there because then they're more accessible. Um, but you still need to ask the question um, uh, to everybody involved in that project. Is this what you want to do? Do you want to make this data? Do you want to make these research outputs openly accessible? Um, next one, please, Carla. Um, and then just a, one other thing really about uh, repositories before we take some questions before and then before um, uh, Carla takes you through a repository uh, as a demonstration is really about um, what's called persistent identifiers. 
So um, one of the key things about using repositories is that it is it creates a long lasting archive of that research output. And this is created by this persistent identifier. Basically, it gives it a number or it actually has letters and numbers in it, I think, um, which um, actually means that then you can just use, that is that will go on forever. That link basically it won't ever break. It's different to other website URLs, um, which um, can actually change or can break. These are meant to be very, very uh, persistent, so long, long lasting. Um, so it, it, it gives you a certain version of that um, research output, um, which is linked to that persistent identifier. Um, and actually, there are different types of persistent identifiers. The one that we see a lot on these um, open uh, repositories is the DO, DOI or Digital Object Identifier. But I've listed some other ones um, as well on this page, which I have seen the Perl One Persistent Uniform Resource loc Locator, which is a real mouthful. Um, I have actually seen that used on some repositories as well. But all of these are very are, are all persistent identifiers that you could have on your research outputs, um, and they were using them. They would take you to that specific location um, on the online of that of that version of your research output. Um, next, and the other really important persistent identifier to have um, on the repositories is uh, the ORCID ID, which is actually a persistent identifier for you as a researcher. And why this is really important, and it's not actually mandatory to put it onto most repositories, which I think is a bit of a shame, actually. Um, but it's easy, but all of them ask you if you want to put it on there. It's because it's your way of claiming all of your research outputs. So essentially, it's you've, you getting credit for all of those research outputs. Um, it's especially helpful for people who change their name throughout their research career. So I am one of those people because I started my research career when I wasn't married and I was Emma Harvey. And then I've transitioned across to being Emma Caroon uh, with a bit of Harvey and Emma Caroon Harvey in between. So I've actually had three names. Um, and on my orchid, um, you can see the different names, but all my because I've had the ORCID for uh, a long time, all of my research outputs get um, uh, get credited to me, whatever name I'm in, uh, because it's linked with a with a number, and that number is is for me. Um, and it's really good as well because on their website you can actually have the list of all of your different outputs. It, it actually enabled you to pull all your outputs from publications directly into this web page, which is a bit like a CV for you of all of your different um, research outputs. And you can use it for different information on there, like your jobs, the committees you sit on. So it's actually quite a useful page that you can turn into like a CV page and you can give that to people to see the work that you've done. Right, I think I've got to everything and we've got to the time where we're going to just pause for a few minutes to take any questions before I'm going to say before Carla goes on to the demonstration, because in our last session, I didn't say that and a few people dropped off. So don't drop off now. There is a lot more to come. We've only just fit, got to the halfway. So please, um, if you want to, you can put a question in the chat or you're very welcome to um, put your hand up in the Zoom and ask a question. I'll just pause for a minute. Yeah, like, oh, there's a hand up, wonderful. Please go for it. Hi, Emma. Hello. Hi. Thank you for this wonderful presentation and thank you also to Carla. This was very clarifying. I actually have um, this doubt about how to organize the data to upload. Um, I was a member of a, of a project that was carried on for about 10 years in the same site. And the director of the project um, unfortunately passed away. And we have like this all of this data that I would like to upload in repositories, but I don't know how to attribute the authorship. 
first, of course, as a member of the project, I've done a lot of the work. So like ceramic analysis and phytoliths and charcoal, but uh, for, uh, for C14 dates, I don't know what to do. And like people get in contact with me and ask for the data and I normally share, but like I just share the data and there is no attribution to authorship and uh, link to how the, the, the dates were produced in our project. And I, I really don't know how to, how to deal with the authorship for the data if I would upload in a repository. A really good question yeah. quite a, quite a <laughs> spicy question as well. yeah but you go first and then i will i will go on that one um uh, okay i mean it uh, how you upload the data to a repository depends on what repository you are choosing uh, so mm -hmm. there are some repositories where you can have um let's say your a, a repository for your project mm -hmm. and then sub repository or or sub yeah sub repositories for different materials within mm -hmm. that project uh, um, osf is one of these i think emma you mm. you you correct me if i'm wrong uh, so i think that so if you have lots of materials that you know, uh, has to be attributed to different people. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to go for one of these repositories. However, any repositories, even uh, even Zenodo that we will um, see later, you mm -hmm. can create different uploads. So let's say one uploads for each document or each output you want to put there mm -hmm. and, and link them all together under the same project or the same community. So the project in itself will mm -hmm. not have a DOI, but every document in it will. And so mm -hmm. in every document or every output, or you know, I say document because it's easier, but in every output, you can put mm -hmm. a different list of authors. So different okay. attribution. Yeah. And then in the description, you can describe, for example, what this output is and to which project it belongs so that everything becomes like more coherent. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I would say this is the way, this is a possible way to go. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think that. And I mean, I, I, like, I like to take a very inclusive um, approach to authorship. So I would want to make sure everybody has got credit for the work they've done now on archaeology projects that's really quite difficult because if you think <laughs> about like do you know who did like the original excavations do you know like or everybody you know i've worked on um sites where we've had you know groups of students coming every year to work on projects do you list all of the students do you do this so yeah. if it's it's that's quite difficult but um as carla said i think if you want different authorship i think you need to be putting the different data sets on there separately but linking them together is very important so that people mm -hmm. can understand so as carla said in in the description you can actually probably do the same introduction to the description you know about the archaeological site but then give details below that are more specific to each of the different outputs so but then it's important to list the other outputs as one thing that um, you can do is once you have uploaded something like to Zenodo, you can actually go back and re and edit the metadata. So the description again. So if mm -hmm. you add more, more files, you can then add those links. So you're continually linking all of your different outputs for that project together. Mm -hmm. that is the linking is very important so that people actually find all of the all of the outputs for each of the projects but then Carla also was saying about open science framework which is one of my favorite uh, repositories because you can have a project and then the mm -hmm. project you can have different outputs under the project uh, with different DOIs for each of those so that does group things together very very well um mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. Good, good luck. <laughs> yeah, thank you. 
Thanks for your question. Um, yeah, I think that this partially answer also Gora uh, question who put who yeah. put in the chat. Uh, no, it's not. It's not a bad practice to put different uh, outputs of the same project in different repositories. Also, because yeah. as we were saying before, different repositories have slightly different characteristics, which might be better for the type of output that you want your that you're putting out. And all of these have a way of either in the description or they have specific places where you can say mm. all these other outputs are linked to this and then you can put all the doi of the other outputs so there's always a way of linking uh, as as long as your output has a doi there's yeah. always a way of linking all your outputs uh, together yeah, I think the only sort of caveat I'd put to that is is you as a you as a researcher your your own work. I do try to put all of my work into one place, and that really is more about things like these presentations, um, the uh, preprints that I work on or training that I do. I do really like to put them. I do mine all in Zenodo because then I think people know that my work is there. And they can search me on that that repository and they find a whole big list of all all the different things that I've done. Um, it doesn't work that way always for research projects because obviously I work with different don't work on my own ever really. Um, so it just depends for that project what's most appropriate. So but maybe as you, if you as a researcher for your individual work, you put it one place. That's probably good, good practice if you want to say. Uh, between good and bad practice although there isn't really bad practice as Carla said um should we just take there's someone with their hand up I think yeah I think uh Ayushi maybe Ayushi yeah thank you um I also want to reiterate that the talk has been really thorough and very informative for me and yeah. also helped clarify a lot of terms that I've been hearing for a while but wasn't fully clear about so this has been really, really helpful. Um, I wanted to ask um, if you had any experience or thoughts on what is now being called modular publishing, which to me sounds mm -hmm. really similar to sort of the open science framework, and I guess to some extent even Zenardo, but I was reading about two websites and one's called Octopus and the other was Octopus. Research yeah. World. Yeah. And that seems to be the sort of thing of like, okay, you have a project and you can kind of um, publish, quote unquote, um, the different aspects of the project and, and like on these websites and each thing that you choose to publish um, has, has its own DOI. So for example, if, yeah. I, if I create a, um, if I create an experiment design, for how I want to go about my analysis, and I publish that, um, then that has a separate DOI to when I eventually publish, say, the data set um, to when the paper eventually comes out in whichever journal it is. Um, do you see that as different? And do you think that that's helpful? So I do. Do you want me to go, Carla? Yeah, I have no, yeah. absolutely no experience on this. So. Yeah, so I do, yeah, I do know about these platforms. They they are very new, and you're right. Open Science Framework is is very similar to these um, Octopus uh, and the other one, which I call uh, Research Equals, isn't it? Um, and the they are it is it is so open science framework encourage you to do uh, pre-registration reports or registered reports with your like hypotheses in the plans of your work and then go on to do pre-prints and upload your data straight away so again it's 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 bit by bit by bit publishing in a way um but thinking about your your project in a in a way where there are sort of multiple many many multiple outputs and i have to say i'm very supportive of publishing very transparent research because i really that's the only way research is going to be reproducible or replicable by other people 
Um, I'm not sure um, some of the, um, the the problem I see with the with things like octopus is that um, if you are because they want you to publish in very small, really, really small amounts. So really like you're just your just your ideas, basically, not even your hypotheses and then going on to publishing methods and things. Um, I can see sometimes there would be a lot of publications at the beginning. And then what happens if in the end you don't really want to publish the other bit? You're kind of missing a bit of the a bit of the work. Um, but yeah, I don't really have a problem with it at all. I'm very supportive of things being very transparent. It's just a new way of doing things, I think. Um, I'm also really supportive of publishing different types of papers, like data papers. Like Carla and I have been writing some data a data paper. Um, and other papers like software papers and um, there's also methods papers. Um, I think it's really good practice to now write those papers because it gives you people a more in-depth, um, transparent record of what you've done, particularly the data papers, I think are very useful for other people reusing your data um, because in traditional research articles, there just isn't enough space to actually explain your data fully or the methods that you use to get there. Um, and so data papers allow you to do that. Um, and um, yes, and yeah, it gives you more outputs basically. And you're really getting a lot of credit for being really um, transparent and uh, uh, sort of responsible, I think, with your data because you, you have to publish it openly, the data set itself, and then you've got a publication to explain it. So in that sense, it's very good open science practice to write data papers and publish in that way. Um, but I'm not 100% sure about Octopus. <laughs> I don't want to say that, but I have. <laughs> um, yeah, I like the transport. So go and have a look at it, everyone. It's it's a really interesting way. But a lot of bio, um, like pure biology um, uh, domains have, have actually been doing that for quite a while. Um, very, very short research articles, um, which I think, think is quite a good thing. Um, easier to publish, I would think, than longer ones. Thanks very much for the questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. So next we have the demonstration, but maybe we take three minutes break so that we also gave a little bit of break to our fantastic interpreters that have been <laughs> working nonstop. So just three minutes break and and then we go with the demonstration, which is going to be the fun part of, uh, of this. Yeah. Right? So we'll come back at 15, 15 minutes past yeah. the hour. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to go with the demonstration now on how to upload uh, uh, something in a repository just again for people who just come in or who come came in during uh, uh, our presentation just to remind you that we have live translations in both Spanish and Chinese and to access that you go uh, at the bottom of your zoom window you'll see this uh, word sort of icon and you can choose in which language you want to listen to this uh, uh, presentation. Right, so let's go to the demonstration time. Okay, so we're now going to show uh, how long-term archiving repositories uh, work and, and how they're used to keep a permanent version of your research output. So these on the, um, on the slides are different forms of repositories um, that you can access. And um, keep in mind that the term repository is sometimes used for very different services and very different tools. Uh, for example, GitHub 
which again we will see in the next session, is also called a repository. Uh, it is actually more like a workspace work for a project. Uh, so, you know, uh, when, when you're talking about, uh, when we are talking today about repository, are, are those spaces, those online spaces that follow the trustworthy guides, as we've been said at the beginning, and that uh, allow you to generate a shareable digital object identifier for yes. your material. Okay. Um, again, I am not going to go too much in details on this slide because you have it in the presentation. So you can uh, always go back to it and have a look at it. But basically, here are some of the most um, or the most commonly used open access repositories, generalist repositories, with their main characteristics. And again, you see here, we, you know, we've listed the storage that, 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 that each one allows you, the storage space that each one uh, allows you to use, uh, whether they've got choices for licenses, uh, you know, whether they have integration with other uh, tools like GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab, etc. So it's all here and you can have a look uh, at your ease. Uh, you can always ask questions later or, you know, get in contact with us if there is anything that uh, uh, you might want to ask. So Today, we are going to look at Zenodo, which is one of, uh, again, one of the most common uh, repositories that you can use for general purposes, right? Um, we will use this an, an, as an example, obviously, but uh, um, as I was saying for the information that you can find in the repositories, uh, the how you upload material is also very similar in the different repositories, right? Because in the end, all of them will want to uh, provide the same information more or less. So it's, it's just a matter, if you're not gonna use Zenodo, it's just a matter of looking at, you know, the repository you're using and knowing what uh, the different information that you need to provide. Okay. So here is Zenodo, right? Um, obviously, the first thing you need to do is you need to create a, an account. Okay. And I'm not going really to show you how to do that because that's kind of self explanatory. Uh, so I'll jump, um, I'll jump through the actual website so I can show you live uh, what we are doing when you are uh, uploading material. All right, so here is the main page of the nodal. Uh, as you can see here in the uh, upper uh, right corner, we've got our open.phytolith.gmail.com, which indicates that we are signed in uh, in our account. So at this point, um, you have here, you can access the information of your profile, you can change the password, you can link accounts, you know, the usual, I mean, this works as any other uh, website where you have to sign up and create a profile, right? No, no mistakes and, and no surprises here. So at this point, when you're here, you want to upload something, right? The first thing I want to um, actually make sure that you understand really easy uh, is that uh, you upload, um, can, can you hear my, yeah, my mouse, right. So you upload from here, right? So you upload from the space where your, um, your account is, let's say. Uh, and I'm saying this because you see here, you know, a, a nice green button that says new upload, which, you know, the first time I uploaded in Zenodo, I made this mistake. I just clicked 
straight away on this, you know, oh, I want to make a new upload. So straight away to the nice green button. Actually, this uploads into this specific community. So, you know, you're actually, you're, you're trying to upload something that is archaeology into the coronavirus disease research community, which obviously, as soon as you try to do it, someone gets in contact with you and says, sorry, this has nothing to do with us. Please put it somewhere else in a very nice way. But that's, you know, that's the, uh, the message. So when you want to upload something for yourself, you just go on this upload here, right? And this basically brings you to your page, your profile. And here you can see all the different outputs that we have uploaded as ICOPS. So as the International Committee on Open Python Science. So you see, uh, there's a list um, of all we have uploaded. So now we want to upload um, something. And for this demonstration, I'm actually going to upload the slides for this presentation that uh, we've been using, right? You would normally just click on new upload, um, but because we have we had to reserve a DOI for this presentation that we've already shared with you, uh, I'm gonna use one that's already been created, right? So this page is exactly the same if you click on new upload, right? When you click on new upload, you get here. So let's have a look at what you have in this page. You have a space where to put your file. And again, this is very similar, very intuitive, and very similar to any other uploading site that you might have been use, using in the past. You can either drag and drop your files here, or you can choose from your computer, right? In my case, I'm going to drag and drop the presentation. And um, as Emma was saying, it's really good if you can upload um, files in a format that is readable to everyone. So the first file I'm going to put in is the presentation in PDF format, right? So I've just dragged it in here. And as you can see, we've got one file, upload, with size, et cetera. Um, you need to push the start upload for each file. So start upload, very quick, progress, done. OK, so now your file is in here. If you want to upload, uh, you can you can drag and drop several files at the same time. In this case, I've just used one. So I want to put on also uh, a modifiable version of this file. As you, as you know, PDF in theory can, cannot be modified. So I'm going to choose another file. Uh, from here, I'm going to put an uh, open office uh, file in here as well. So you see that now we have another file, you know, different size, obviously, it's not compressed. Um, notice that the one, aside from the fact that the progress is not ticked, the, the color also is different. So the file that is not yet uploaded is black and it's not clickable. The file that has been uploaded is blue and it's a link. So you just upload this file as well. And there you go. Okay, So you've got both files in there. The next information that um, obviously, I mean, I haven't said that, but there are fields that are uh, mandatory and fields that are recommended uh, and you know fields that are optional. Obviously, the files 
is mandatory. I mean, there's no point in creating, uh, uh, you know, in, a, in creating a repository if you don't upload anything, right? So the 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 files are mandatory, and here they are. The next, let's minimize this. The next, um, the next information that it's been asked is whether this file belongs to a specific community. As you can see, as you see, this is recommended. It's not compulsory, so you can leave it uh, and skip or put something. And as we were talking before, it's it's really important if you can put something in here because it will give it more visibility with the with your colleagues, you know, with with your um, in your field. And if you hover off on the question mark here, you get an explanation, you know, uh, on what communities are and what they are uh, needed for. And so, one that it's um, that it's always good to have because. This, um, this presentation belongs to a training that is being carried out with European funded, European funded research. So this is a community that, you know, it's always good to have. Um, another one, because we do have our own community. Let's see if I can find it from here. Okay, might not be called fair fight. Oh, yeah, it's called open fight, but it's, that's why I couldn't find it. There you go. Open fight, elite. and there you go. You've got the open fight elite community, right? So, in here, you can add as many communities as you think might be interested uh, in your. Um, for your data and this this is linked to what I was saying at the beginning. If you upload directly into a community, because whenever you link a community to your uploading, the community manager gets notified about a new upload. Uh, if you by mistake upload into a community that does you know where your work doesn't belong you'll get a message from them saying, look, you might have made a mistake because this is not the right community for your work. If your your work belongs to that community, then fine, you know, no, no one is gonna bother you. Next information is what type of upload you are putting out. So as you see, you have publication, poster, presentation, data set, image, video, software, lesson, physical object, a workflow, or other, right? You can, you can pick any of these. In this case, it's a presentation. So, you know, easy piece, we go there. And this is a required information. So you need to say what you are uploading. Then we go to the basic information. Again, this is required the basic information about your upload. First thing first, the, the DOI, okay, right? So I told you at the beginning that we already had a DOI for this because we've shared it with you already. So I'm gonna go and copy that, right? If you, this, this DOI, um, is the one we've created for this presentation, but it can also be a DOI that you received from something external. You see in the description here, you um, it tells you if your publisher has already assigned a DOI to your upload, you can just copy it, the DOI here, it's fine. Otherwise you can reserve a DOI uh, in Zenodo, which is what we did for this presentation, right? You put here the publication date, today, and the title. I've just copied uh, the same information as for 
the previous presentation so that I ensure that uh, we are all we, we are always using the same standards in terms of titles and uh, uh, and description. Um, so here it is. Workshop on using repositories. Again, pretty easy. And here you can put anything. Data set of title it from uh, uh, name of site slash country. You know, uh, I don't know. Presentation given, uh, presentation given at the European uh, Association of Archaeologists Conference uh, in 2022. Anything that you want, as long as it's indicative of what you're uploading. Then you've got all the authors, right? With the ORCID that Emma was talking about, that is your, your personal uh, identifier. I'm definitely not going to put all the uh, authors here because we are very many, but uh, um, family names, Tarun. Uh, I think, uh, sorry, Tarun, Emma, the ORCID, it's enough. And if you want, you can put the affiliation. Uh, I'm going to say historic England, uh, et cetera. And then you can add another author, I'm add myself. My affiliation. And my org ID, which obviously I don't remember, so I'm going to copy from here. And so on and so forth. I mean, I'm not going to add all of this right now because this is an information that you can always um, come back and edit at a later time. So, um, so I'm I'm going to do that later. Um, next, you have the description of the material that you are uploading. Okay. Um, again, I have prepared this in advance because otherwise we could have been here for ages. And I'm just going to copy it in here. Maybe not all in bold. A little bit too much. <laughs> I'm just gonna okay. I saw typo here, it's all runs, it runs. <laughs> okay. Um so in here you can put whatever you want, and the recommendation is the more you put the better. All the information here should be. Uh, used that should be useful for people to understand exactly what you are uploading. And this is very important, for example, when you're uploading data, uh, when you're uploading a, a Excel file, for example, or a CSV, CSV file with your Phytolist data, um, not everyone might be able to understand fully your um, your acronyms or your, you know, the, the words you're using. So you can put all all that in here. You can you can describe your data set in here with as many or as much information as possible. Right. Um, and you see, this all these up to now, all these items had an asterisk, which means these are the ones that are required. From now on, you go into the uh, optional information. Uh, one, for example, is the version, right? Normally you start with version one. So this is the first version of this, uh, um, of this um, presentation that we are uploading. Um, this is useful because once you've, up, once you've published the uh, data set, you can edit it, uh, you can edit the record, but there are some things that you cannot edit, which are the files. So if you want to change the files, if you want to make some major changes in the files, you have to create a new version. And this is because um, your files have 
a digital object identifier which is linked to them. So anyone that has that identifier has to be able to reach the original file that you uploaded. So if you want to change something, you need to create a newer version. This might seem a bit uh, daunting because you're like, oh my God, what happens if I realize that I made a mistake once, you know, especially once I've shared the, uh, the, the OI with other people. Well, not to panic, this happens. Uh, and there are several ways in which you can remedy this. Okay, first of all, um, if you realize immediately, like after immediately after creating uh, and publishing the repository that you've made a mistake and then you need to change the file, you can contact the nodo. They have a grace period of one week in which, uh, um, and it's not here, I'll, I'll show you later, uh, in which you can contact them. They have a form, right? Uh, where you describe what happened and what's the issue and they evaluate whether they can, uh, change the time for you. Otherwise, if if the grace period has passed, you can still make changes. You just need to create a newer version. So what happens to the DOI of, so a, sorry, a newer version means a new DOI for your file, right? Uh, so what happens to the people who are who have or who have seen uh, your original like version one DOI. Um, they keep having that and when they click on it, they'll get taken to the original files. However, the, those original files will have a warning saying, look, there is a new version of these files. You should go and look at version two and there's a link at ver to version two. Right, and as a further um, way of making sure that no one is using the wrong files, you can change the access right of your version one from open to closed. In that way, when someone uh, uses a DOI that corresponds to files that are no longer valid, they get they still get to the original page where they still see the, look, there's a new version of these files. And on top of that, they cannot download or see or click on the original file. So the only option is to go to the newer version. And then here you can put, um, you can put other information, the language, this is it. We've got English, right? Uh, you can even choose, you know, what type of English. Only all, well, I guess it's just for if, if it's a very specific language, otherwise uh, you just leave it blank. Uh, you can put keywords here. So again, in order to be sure that uh, it's consistent, uh, um, I, I'm not gonna, I haven't actually copied that, but I think we've got open research and then spite the And uh, again, you can add this later on uh, as many as you want. And again, and you can put any notes that you think might be relevant to this specific upload. So this is done. Once you've done this, the only other required item that you need to put is access right. So whether you want, you want it to be open access, whether you want it to be embargoed, which means, you know, it will be closed for a limited amount of time and then it will become open. You can still put it as a restricted access, um, which means that you know people will need to contact you to get access to this, or it can be completely closed. Obviously, 
embargoed, restricted, and closed are not options that we are interested at the moment, but they could be useful if you have, for example, if the journal you're trying to publish in it has specific embargo uh, policies on your data, and you know, and by putting this open access, you might be violating those policies, so you can choose this. Uh, you see, if you click on the embargoed access, they will ask you, you know, okay, until when are these embargoed? And you have to put the data. Uh, if you click on the restricted access, you have to uh, say what are the conditions to access it, you know, only for public. Uh, um, uh, for people belonging to public institutions or contact the authors or you know uh, only if you're part of the project so again whatever you want to um, you want to put however uh, these have you know um, you have basically to decide what these conditions are and you are responsible to grant access uh, based, based on these conditions Right or closed access means you know they're here they have a DOI but no one can access them and this I think uh, or at least I cannot think of other um, instances except for what I was um, describing before right if you had to make um, changes important changes so if you've created a version two and you want people just to use version two because you've realized that version one has some mistakes, right? Otherwise, just go for uh, open access and anyone can access the data based on the license. And this is by default, the license that uh, uh, is um, attached to the Zenodo um, repositories. Obviously, you can change it, right? Uh, Emma has been explaining what the um, the main um, licenses are, and uh, you can just change and pick any other of this uh, license. We'll go for the uh, 4.0 attribution. Okay, this means that anyone can use, reuse, etc., providing that their site. And then. You see, you, you can put really a lot of information attached to your uh, um, to your uploading. Some are re again are recommended, some other are optional. In this case, recommended if your research has been paid by someone, well, give credit to it. So in this case, we've got EOS Life. Yes. And you know, it's already there. You can add more grants if needed. You know, just type it in. Uh, and obviously, you know, not, not all of them has to be European Commission. You've got a list, you know, of uh, public funders, right? In this case, we only have one. Um, what else? Everything else is optional, right? One thing that uh, is nice and it actually came up in the question is how do I link other uh, outputs? Where in here you can link, uh, you can link um, other outputs that are part of the same project or that are relevant or uh, um, that you you think you know, um, might need to be added here. And as you see, you can use a DOI or a handle or arc or curl, you know, anything that uh, identifies something permanently. Uh, you can add more contributors, so people who are not author of this, but have somehow contributed, again, in the same way with the name, the affiliation, the ORCID, and you can say what kind of contribution they've provided uh, to this um, project or to this uh, upload. Uh, you can add references, 
you know, for the uh, material that you've been using, or, you know, if this is linked to a paper, you can link again a paper here. You, if, if what you're uploading is part of a, a journal um, pro output as well, you can put here the journal title, the volume, the issue, the pages, all the information. If what you are doing, if what you're uploading is part of a conference, you can add the information about the conference, you know, and so on and so forth. If it's a book, if it's a thesis, you know, whatever. Whatever you want to add, you can add. Right, and whatever doesn't fit in one of these boxes, you can add in the description. If there is something else that you need, that you think you need to add, then you can add in the description. When you're done, you click save, and you click publish. So you get a warning that it says, once the record is published, you will no longer be able to change the files. So are you sure that these are all the files that you want to put in and these are the correct files? Yeah, I understand. These are the correct files. And that's it. You've got your, uh, you've got your up upload completed. So you've got the, description, the title and the description, you've got your communities. In here, you will see how many people have seen it or downloaded it. Uh, you've got places where it's going to be indexed in. You've got the publication date, the DOI, the keyword, the grants, the link to the community, anything that you want to do. And here you have a preview of your files. And here you can just download um, or preview. In this case, because it's the same file, the preview is going to be the same. But if you have different files, the previews obviously is going to be different. Or you can download and you know you can export the citation. Um, in here it tells you what version it is. So you know that this is version one. If you create a second version uh, underneath here, you will have version two with its uh, DOI. So all you need to do for this, or you need to know for this upload. And here you've got two very important buttons, the edit that, as I told you, you can go back and edit the information, but not the files, or the new version, which will allow you to uh, upload new files and create a completely new version. Okay, I think that's all. Um, it's all here in the presentation. So everything that I've um, that I've explained, it's step by step in the presentation. So if you can go back and have a look at it and and uh, you know see. Um, what you need to do if you want. Uh, should be fairly self-explanatory. Um, we have, sorry, I've realized that again, we've gone quite, uh, you know, quite long. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, what I just wanted to show you is that uh, we've got, uh, uh, we've got also Figshare, the guide for Figshare, which is another type of repository. So again, it's explained step by step. So if you if you want to do picture instead of uh, of Zenodo, you've got all the um, all the guide here to go step by step uh, uploading things in you know, in a picture. And we're back to the questions. Thanks, Carla. That was amazing. <laughs> Sorry, a bit long. <laughs> no, I think it's going to be quite long explaining. Yeah. Right, we have got a question. Yeah, yeah I've, I've got um, another question that is kind of related to my previous one. Previous one. Carla, you explained that you can link in the nodal to communities, and mm -hmm. um, but how would I 
link link it with uh, my project would be on those features down uh, way down on the nodal that I would like link to different pro different outputs of a project. Is that? Yeah. Oh. Uh, you would put probably in the description saying mm -hmm. this output is part of this project and you can put a link in the description as well mm -hmm. you know if you have a website or you know whatever mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you can say you know all the material related to the project uh, can be found you know uh, in the uh, linked material mm -hmm. section of this upload uh, I don't know. It will probably appear also on the on the record page somehow in the mm -hmm. information. All the linked material, I guess. Um, okay. Yeah, but you can also create a community because anyone can create community, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So you can create a community that is your project if you want. Okay. Right, mm -hmm. and then and then every time you upload something, just link it to that community, and everything will be also findable in that way. Oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If it's so, a if it's a large project, I think that's a really good idea because mm -hmm. then it does it there's all of your outputs together. Yeah. So it, it doesn't have to be like a huge community or anything. I think that's what we yeah. think of, like whole domains like together, yeah. but it doesn't have to. It can just be a a large project. It could be the community. Um, so that sounds like a good idea for you. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. And thank you for this section. It's actually, yeah. <laughs> we, Welcome. Yeah, th thank you. We, we didn't say it, but, or maybe we say it, I don't remember, but all these, are recorded uh, mm -hmm. all these videos and we will be uploaded in our uh, YouTube channel and also archived uh, uh, on our website or somehow uh, we are still yes, working on it. will be. <laughs> yeah. So at some point, you know, you'll be able to access it if you, you know, if, uh, if you want to re, re listen mm -hmm. to some of the explanations. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, come back and check because I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm sure it, it, it is a learning curve. Yeah, but yeah. As, there's as many, you, yeah, that's many details that yeah. uh, I'm sure we're gonna have doubts while we start organizing all our different outputs to put on these repositories. I, I'm sure we're going to need to get back and check on the basic instructions. Yeah, but yeah. as you've seen, it's I think that everything is very clear and in yeah. some way self-explanatory, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, these, these repositories are, are thought to be easy to, to use, you know, and uh, not, mm -hmm. not too complicated. Obviously, as you said, it is a learning process and there's, you discover something every time, mainly because every time you have to do something slightly different, you know, mm -hmm. because, you know, for your own, project you know uh, one day is just uploading a presentation and the next day is you know uploading a presentation that is linked to a project or that it's linked to another presentation that another person is so every time you have to upload something it's slightly different yeah. and you learn something but after a while you know you get the hang of it very okay thank you uh, we have another question in the chat Again from Gorab, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing mispronouncing your name. Uh, which asked, uh, who asked, is it a good idea to just link shared work rather than duplicating it across different authors with different accounts? Uh, I would say yes, especially. Um, I mean, I think it's a mistake that I. I mean, I know it's a mistake that I have done at the beginning, which was um uploading the same material in different places so for example i would deposit uh the uh, a data set in the university in my institutional repository and then also uploading in the nodal because uh, i discovered the node and say oh why it should, it should be here uh what you end up is that you have different uh doi for the same thing 
So it, mm. it might get a bit confusing, you know, after a while, especially if then you have created a, 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 a version two of something on somewhere and not on somewhere else, right? So uh, mm. it's definitely better to, um, if you have different output, that if you have different authors that, you know, one output and then it's linked to different people. And you can put multiple authors, so yeah, it's yeah. fine. Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, or the other thing also to say is that the account that you upload um, that is the output doesn't. That person actually doesn't have to be an author on the on the upload because Carla showed that because actually we have a oh that Zenodo account is actually our our committee account so it doesn't have anybody's actual name it's called open fighter list that account and that account isn't named as an author we are named as authors the committee members so um so you can uh because i i also do upload other people's work on zenodo and but me don't put myself on it and i can just use my personal account because it doesn't really it doesn't link you really to that if I mean if you bring it up it would show I've I've uploaded it but it, the credit is given to the people that uh, are the authors and it's linked to their orchid so yeah um, are there any other questions and yes the first video from the the first workshop video is now on YouTube we have a YouTube channel that's called open fighter this i think um probably <laughs> uh, open fighterless community maybe i think it's actually called icops open fighter list um and that can be uh, you can watch that on there from the first uh, shop um we are working to also put um uh versions on there which have the translations as sub at the moment the version is just the english version so um, we will be uploading different language versions with different subtitles. Um, and probably just to finish um, is to say thank you very much to Carla. Um, thank, thank you very you. much to Zach that has been helping us in the background, um, answering questions and doing technical things. Thank you also to our interpreters, our Spanish interpreters, Maria and Anna, and also our Chinese interpreters. Tiankui, who's there as well. So thank you so much. Yeah, just, sorry, just one last, very, very, very last thing, because we didn't have time for you to try and mm. upload your thing. If anyone yeah. is going to do, is going to try or is going to upload something and you have problems, questions, uh, doubts, etc., just get in contact with us and yeah. we'll be happy to help. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks. see you next time, which is GitHub, which there are two sessions next month on the 21st and the 28th. I'm just looking at my calendar of April. So there's two sessions. The first one is basic GitHub. So if you've never used it before, it's starting from absolute zero. Um, and then the second one is working from the basic to being a bit more collaborative. So I'd very much recommend coming to learn that, which is a sort of repository workspace version control tool that's very useful for um, researchers. So thanks very much and bye bye. Have a lovely weekend. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>